You know, somebody recently asked me how I got over the fear of kayaking. I don't think that we really get to get over the fear. Fear is something I deal with all the time. Everybody I know deals with it regularly. We just get better at handling it and making decisions with the fear. Fear is information. It's not a bad thing. So how do we use that information for our decision making and kayaking? And how do we approach kayaking from a better mindset? Let's dig in. I don't even know where to start with this one, guys. I mean, really, like, fear is so tied into everything that we do. There's no way I could do this in one video. I don't even know I could do it in a series. We're gonna give it an effort. There was a study done in skydivers measuring their heart rate with skydiving. And the heart rate of these skydivers didn't peak during the skydive, on the landing, in the airplane, at the drop zone, no. Their heart rate peaked. The peak of their heart rate was when they made the decision to skydive, to dri start driving toward the drop zone. So if you've ever been one of those people that feels a, like your stomach is in knots the moment you've decided to go kayak a new river, you're not alone. In fact, you're pretty normal. A lot of times when you scout rapids, it's not uncommon to get more scared the more you look or scout a rapid. I'm a little different. I become more calm. I feel better the longer I stare at a rapid. Either way is okay. I'm not here to judge and hopefully you're not judging yourself for your, your fear and how you experience it. The truth is we're all different and unique in the way that we experience the fear, but we're all similar in the sense that we have to deal with it. So however it is, however it's showing up for you and wherever you are in paddle sports, whether you're trying to just get over the fear of rolling, trying to, to just harness and, and recognize that you have skill and depend on that. Or if you're an expert and you've been paddling class five for year after year after year and now you have a family and you're trying to figure out how far you can push it, you're technically dealing with the same fear. And it's the same cost-benefit analysis that we're talking about now. After something scary or after something bad on the river, it's normal to feel scared. It's normal to feel extra scared and it's normal to feel a little extra amped up and maybe even need a break. But this is all about you. It's an experience that you've chosen for you. And it has to be that personal. It has to be something that you've taken on for yourself. So whatever you're going through and whatever mental challenge you've got to face, you're not alone. My goal here is to give you guys some tools for breaking down what you're experiencing 
understanding it more and figuring out some tools to approach it in the future. So what is the problem with fear anyway? But truth is, fear is healthy. It gives you information. It tells you how it is that you're feeling about what's happening around you. But it also shifts the blood flow in your brain, shifts it away from the frontal lobe, and it makes you less intelligent. People make really dumb decisions when they're scared. Intelligence is how you're going to make it through the thing that you're afraid of. It kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're really just gonna go toward the very thing that scares you. And you're likely gonna manifest that for yourself in one way or another. If you see an undercut on the river and you don't wanna go into it and you fixate on it, chances are you are going right into that rock. So we have to have some tools to getting past the fear. The best way to face the fear though, is to understand it. Knowledge, understanding, looking at what you're afraid of and why, that's the only way that I've found to really get past the whole fear and to give up that control that fear has over you. So step one is just accepting that the fear is there and recognizing that there's a different choice, that there's a different way to approach it. The next step in that process is understanding and focusing on why you do what you do. Why are you kayaking? There's something about, you know, being completely immersed in that environment and walking through a forest. You hear your footsteps, you hear the birds in the water as you, as you get closer and you hear a waterfall and you hear this roar. You see the power of the river and then you have an opportunity to join it. People always ask, what does it give you and why do you do these things? And the truth is that it gives me the greatest gift of all. I get to know myself. I get to find myself in kayaking. I get to see me. I learn what I'm strong at, what I'm good at, how I'll respond to different situations in different environments. I get to face, you know, exactly what challenges I'm willing to take on and which challenges I'm not willing to take on. And there are some drops where I walk away and it surprises me. And there are some drops I step up to and those surprise me too. And every single time I make a choice to walk something or run something, I'm different. I change and I grow from it. That's what I get from kayaking. What you get from kayaking may be different, but it's important to make sure you know what kayaking brings you. The next step is one that gets better with age and honestly, I'm gonna have to make another video and that's self-assessment. When you know yourself, you know what you're capable of and you know when you have something or not. Easiest way to assess yourself is to make hard moves on easy rivers and lots of them. That'll build confidence and you'll be able to know what moves you can make and what moves you may miss as you progress to more challenging rivers. That doesn't mean you're done dealing with the fear, but gaining that confidence is a big step in the right direction. So a lot of it starts with proper self-assessment. If you're a beginner and you're still working on your role and the role is a challenge, then you need to go into an environment with somebody that you trust where you'll have to roll a lot. I'm gonna do another video on bomb-proofing your role. But in the meantime, having a friend flip you from behind when you don't know it's coming and then keeping it going is a good way to build confidence in your role. But the point is, no matter where you are on skill level, from a beginner to an expert, building up that confidence involves going wherever you feel safe and making it challenging. That's how you build the proper skills to self-assess whether or not you can make a move. Step is situational awareness. You've got to find a way to broaden your perspective and broaden what you see on the river and escape the tunnel vision that forms with fear. A lot of times we get pretty focused and hyper-focused and our vision shrinks down to only what we're doing. But the best thing we can do for ourselves and for the people around us on the river is take that narrow focus and broaden it up to where we see more, do more, and experience more. 
Notice how pretty the river is. Notice how good the water feels. Notice the people on the bank. Engage with them, talk to them, say hi while you paddle by, and really find a way to keep your perspective broad. Broadening your perspective increases your situational awareness and helps you properly assess where you are in that situation. The other piece of that situational awareness is proper risk assessment. So making sure that as you're broadening your focus, you're not just seeing the worst case scenario of what could happen on a rapid, focus on the most likely scenario. What is the most likely consequence of missing a move? The most likely consequence of missing a move is not death. The most likely consequence may be a swim, maybe some discomfort, maybe some other things, but it's probably not as bad as you think. You've broadened your perspective, you've properly self-assessed, you have all of this information to work on, you can logically know that you have a, have a rapid or can make a move, but it's still challenging and still difficult. You're still feeling fear. Well, yeah. The truth is there's a little part of your brain called the amygdala that is going to make sure your self-preservation is intact. The amygdala will start screaming the moment it knows that you're in potential danger. And so the next step is probably the hardest step. This is where most people get the most stuck, and that is making sure that you learn to trust yourself. You have to trust your abilities and your assessment and know that you have it to calm the amygdala down. You have to acknowledge it and you have to say, it's okay, I know I'm scared, but I have properly self-assessed, I've properly assessed the situation, I've looked at the most likely scenarios for the proper risk, I've chosen to take this on and I've made the decision to go. Then when you peel out, exhale and take a deep breath and what you typically find is your body will start to flow. The amygdala calms down and you become a better paddler and you're able to take on the fear. So while you're working those steps, what are some things you can do in the meantime? A few things that I tell people that I do myself, one is I focus on being present. It's really easy to get overwhelmed if you try to take on the whole river at once. But if you can focus on what's necessary right now and focus on the immediate rapid that you're in, typically you can simplify what you need to do and to know more than three things. And if you, anybody can focus on just like, you know, one to three things, there's usually only a couple of strokes that matter. So simplify the instructions on a rapid as well. Think about just the one rapid and just what needs to happen in the moment. Take a moment if you feel overwhelmed may sound really intuitive and like something that doesn't need to be said, but actually it's good to be able to just pause, hit the pause button, take a couple of deep breaths, put your hand in the river, feel the water, and focus on the connection and the beauty that's around you. I found that if you focus on how beautiful the river is, and you focus on how the water feels, and you focus on being connected to it, the rest seems to fall away and you're able to focus a little bit more on what you need to do rather than being afraid. All these things ultimately start with proper preparation. Having the right gear for the run, doing your research to make sure that you're really up for it, thinking ahead about what mental challenges you might face and deciding ahead of time what you might need to do to face it. But it also comes down with who you're paddling with. You wanna paddle with good, safe, supportive people. And you wanna make sure that you can trust them to run a good safety for you and that you can feel like you're getting what you need out of the run when you paddle with them. If you're paddling with people that get in the way of your why or rush you and don't let you take a moment, you might need to rethink who you're paddling with. It could just be that you're not that compatible. Another thing that surfers found and when they were taking big wave beat downs and something that I found when I'm on the river, laugh. You get splashed in the face, you're hit in a big hole, you get flipped over and have to roll, roll laughing, laugh at it. It may sound silly, but the truth is it keeps you positive, but it also immediately impacts your heart rate and makes it so you can hold your breath longer, you can work more efficiently, it calms your body down. You don't want to over celebrate. You don't want to give a ton of energy at the end of a drop, but you do need to be grateful 
and have some gratitude for your accomplishments. When something goes well, or when something shouldn't have gone as well as it did and it did anyway, be grateful. Take a moment to feel it, thank the river for it, thank yourself for that experience, and internally just celebrate some of those accomplishments. Keep that positive outlook because staying positive is going to directly impact how you perceive the rest of the river. I'm not gonna devote a, a big part of this video to dealing with other people's fear. I feel like that deserves a video all on itself and probably in group dynamics or something along those lines. But at some point, you're not gonna be the most scared person on the river. It's important to know you don't have to take on their fear. Group fear is a thing. Setting that boundary of that's your fear, this is my fear, is okay, and it's encouraged. The other thing that I avoid is getting on to people about their fear. If somebody else is feeling something, I'm not gonna tell them it's, it's not okay for them to feel that fear or feel that anxiety about a drop. That's theirs to deal with, it's not mine. It's not mine to shame them and it's not mine to tell them what to do. That's an important distinction. Giving others in your group the ability to make the decisions for themselves is vital. But holding the space for yourself to make a decision for yourself is also vital. Understanding that the decision has to be yours just because everybody else walked doesn't mean you have to too. There's a book that really helped me called The Rise of Superman. And I'm gonna link the book in the comments, but one of the things in the flow studies that it talks about is that in a true flow state, you gain microseconds rather than lose them. So instead of time feeling like everything happens so fast, you get a different time distortion where everything feels like it happens in slow motion. It's like you get more time and you have more information to work with with what you're doing and your performance increases in that moment. It requires a struggle phase. You have to be nervous in order to reach that flow state and most people tend to approach the flow state when they approach a challenge that is perceived 4% more difficult than their skill level. Now I'm not telling you to go paddle above your skill level, but what I am telling you is that if you perceive something as difficult and challenging, but still in reach, you're gonna feel nervous and that nervousness a lot of times lets you know that you understand the decision that you're making and it'll help you get into that flow state. Read the book, it's a really good book. It helped me a lot uh, with my mental game, but it also has helped a lot of people that I know. And in kayaking, you're having to face yourself a lot. Probably a lot more than a lot of other sports. It's perfectly fine to look at a rapid that I know is in my skill set, but decide that I need to walk it. That's gonna happen. Choosing to walk a rapid is a natural part of kayaking. We often walk rapids that we're more than capable of running. Are you walking it because you just can't quite trust yourself to know that you've got it? Or are you walking it because it just doesn't feel right today? Are you walking it respectfully because today's just not right? There's a big difference in the energy there. So follow these steps, work through the fear, and what you'll find is that your mental game strengthens. If you want to desensitize yourself to a rapid that scares you, or if you want to find a way to get comfortable running a certain type of water more frequently, finding something that represents that difficulty or that type of rapid or that type of fear that is well within your ability that's still scary to you and kayaking it over and over and over again is a good way to train mentally to handle it more often. Repetition is a big part of that desensitization that you may need. To recap, step one is just accepting that you're human. Accepting that you have fear, fear is information, it's a part of what we do. Step two is knowing your why and why you do it. You've gotta be clear on that. Kayaking has too much inherent risk to not understand what you get out of it. Step three is proper self-assessment, which is a long-term skill, but it's one you can build by doing hard moves on easy rivers and clearly being open to the fact that you still have to work on moves. Just because you can roll doesn't mean it's great. Just because you can turn the boat doesn't mean your turning strokes are good. So proper self-assessment is the next piece to work on. 
Step four is good situational awareness, broadening your perspective, but also that risk management piece of looking at what is the most likely scenario if you make a mistake. What's the most likely consequence? Not the worst consequence, but the most likely one. And lastly, that self-trust piece. You've got to find that trust in yourself to trust your decision making, because if you can trust your decision making, the fear becomes less relevant. It becomes information as a part of the decision, but you're able to push past it. I could make a lot of videos on these and there's no way this is all inclusive. Hopefully this gives you some tools to work with to make the decisions for yourself and to understand the decisions that we all have to make in kayaking. You may have something else for you. If there's something else that you do, I want to hear it. Tell me in the comments what else you do. What do you do that calms you down and helps you feel good when you're kayaking? If you like this video, guys, make sure you like and subscribe, pass it around and share it. I'm always looking for more content. If you have more questions, post them in the comments. I'll see you on the river.